Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Part 2, Section 16, Chapters 78 through 83. Chapter 78 After I had let my statue cool for two whole days, I began to uncover it by slow degrees. The first thing I found was that the head of Medusa had come out most admirably, thanks to the air vents, for, as I had told the Duke, it is the nature of fire to ascend. Upon advancing farther, I discovered that the other head, that, namely of Perseus, had succeeded no less admirably, and this astonished me far more, because it is at a considerably lower level than that of the Medusa. Now the mouths of the mould were placed above the head of Perseus and behind his shoulders, and I found that all the bronze my furnace contained had been exhausted in the head of this figure. It was a miracle to observe that not one fragment remained in the orifice of the channel, and that nothing was wanting in the statue. In my great astonishment, I seemed to see in this the hand of God, arranging and controlling all. I went on uncovering the statue with success, and ascertained that everything had come out in perfect order, until I reached the foot of the right leg on which the statue rests. There, the heel itself was formed, and going farther, I found the foot apparently complete. This gave me great joy on the one side, but was half unwelcome to me on the other, merely because I had told the Duke that it could not come out. However, when I reached the end, it appeared to me that the toes and the little piece above them were unfinished, so that about half the foot was wanting. Although I knew that this would add a trifle to my labor, I was very well pleased, because I could now prove to the Duke how well I understood my business. It is true that far more of the foot than I expected had been perfectly formed. The reason of this was that, from causes I have recently described, the bronze was hotter than our rules of art prescribe, also that I had been obliged to supplement the alloy with my pewter cups and platters, which no one else, I think, had ever done before. Having now ascertained how successfully my work had been accomplished, I lost no time in hurrying to Pisa, where I found the Duke. He gave me a most gracious reception, as did also the Duchess, and although the Major Domo had informed them of the whole proceedings, their excellencies deemed my performance far more stupendous and astonishing when they heard the tale from my own mouth. When I arrived at the foot of Perseus, and said it had not come out perfect, just as I previously warned His Excellency, I saw an expression of wonder pass over his face, while he related to the Duchess how I had predicted this beforehand. Observing the princess to be so well disposed towards me, I begged leave from the Duke to go to Rome. He granted it in most obliging terms, and bade me return as soon as possible to complete his Perseus, giving me letters of recommendation meanwhile to his ambassador, Averardo Saristori, we were then in the first years of Pope Giulio de Monti. Chapter 79 Before leaving home, I directed my workpeople to proceed according to the method I had taught them. The reason of my journey was as follows. I had made a life-sized bust in bronze of Bindo Altoviti, the son of Antonio, and had sent it to him at Rome. He set it up in his study, which was very richly adorned with antiquities and other works of art, but the room was not designed for statues or for paintings, since the windows were too low, so that the light coming from beneath spoiled the effect they would have produced under more favorable conditions. It happened one day that Bindo was standing at his door, when Michele Agnolo Bonarotti, the sculptor, passed by, so he begged him to come in and see his study. Michele Agnolo followed, and on entering the room and looking round, he exclaimed, Who is the master who made that good portrait of you in so fine a manner? You must know that that bust pleases me as much, or even more, than those antiques. And yet there are many fine things to be seen among the latter. If those windows were above instead of beneath, the whole collection would show to greater advantage, and your portrait, placed among so many masterpieces would hold its own with credit. No sooner had Michele Agnolo left the house of Bindo 
Then he wrote me a very kind letter, which ran as follows. My dear Benvenuto, I have known you for many years as the greatest goldsmith of whom we have any information, and henceforth I shall know you for a sculptor of like quality. I must tell you that Master Bindo Altoviti took me to see his bust in bronze, and informed me that you had made it. I was greatly pleased with the work, but it annoyed me to notice that it was placed in a bad light, for if it was suitably illuminated, it would show itself to be the fine performance that it is. This letter abounded with the most affectionate and complimentary expressions toward myself, and before I left for Rome, I showed it to the Duke, who read it with much kindly interest, and said to me, Benvenuto, if you write to him and persuade him to return to Florence, I will make him a member of the forty-eight. Accordingly, I wrote a letter full of warmth, and offered in the Duke's name a hundred times more than my commission carried, but not wanting to make any mistake, I showed this to the Duke before I sealed it, saying to his most illustrious excellency, Prince, perhaps I have made him too many promises. He replied, Michele Agnolo deserves more than you have promised, and I will bestow on him still greater favors. To this letter he sent no answer, and I could see that the Duke was much offended with him. Chapter 80 When I reached Rome, I went to lodge in Bindo Altoviti's house. He told me at once how he had shown his bronze bust to Michele Agnolo, and how the latter had praised it. So we spoke for some length upon this topic. I ought to narrate the reasons why I had taken this portrait. Bindo had in his hands twelve hundred golden crowns of mine, which formed part of five thousand he had lent the duke. Four thousand were his own, and mine stood in his name while I received that portion of the interest which accrued to me. This led to my taking his portrait, and when he saw the wax model for the bust, he sent me fifty golden scudi by a notary in his employ, named Sir Giuliano Pacali. I did not want to take the money, so I sent it back to him by the same hand, saying at a later time to Bindo, I shall be satisfied if you keep that sum of mine for me at interest, so that I may gain a little on it. When we came to square accounts on this occasion, I observed that he was ill-disposed towards me, since, instead of treating me affectionately, according to his previous wont, he put on a stiff air, and although I was staying in his house, he was never good-humoured, but always surly. However, we settled our business in a few words. I sacrificed my pay for his portrait, together with the bronze, and we arranged that he should keep my money at 15% during my natural life. Chapter 81 One of the first things I did was to go and kiss the Pope's feet, and while I was speaking with His Holiness, Messer Averardo Serristori, our Duke's envoy, arrived. I had made some proposals to the Pope, which I think he would have agreed upon, and I should have been very glad to return to Rome on account of the great difficulties which I had at Florence but I soon perceived that the ambassador had countermined me. Then I went to visit Michele Agnolo Bonarotti, and repeated what I had written from Florence to him in the Duke's name. He replied that he was engaged upon the fabric of St. Peter's, and that this would prevent him from leaving Rome. I rejoined that, as he had decided on the model of that building, he could leave its execution to his man Urbino, who would carry out his orders to the letter. I added much about future favors in the form of a message from the Duke. Upon this, he looked me hard in the face and said with a sarcastic smile, And you, to what extent are you satisfied with him? Although I replied that I was extremely contented and was very well treated by His Excellency, he showed that he was acquainted with the greater part of my annoyances and gave as his final answer that it would be difficult for him to leave Rome. To this I added that he could not do better than to return to his own land, which was governed by a prince renowned for justice, and the greatest lover of the arts and sciences, who ever saw the light of this world. As I have remarked above, he had with him a servant of his who came from Urbino, and had lived many years in his employment, rather as valet and housekeeper than anything else, 
This indeed was obvious, because he had acquired no skill in the arts. Consequently, while I was pressing Michele Agnolo with arguments he could not answer, he turned round sharply to Urbino as though to ask him his opinion. The fellow began to bawl out in his rustic way, I will never leave my master Michele Agnolo's side till I shall have flayed him, or he shall have flayed me. These stupid words forced me to laugh, and without saying farewell, I lowered my shoulders and retired. Chapter 82 The miserable bargain I had made with Bindo Altoviti, losing my bust and leaving him my capital for life, taught me what the faith of merchants is, so I returned in bad spirits to Florence. I went at once to the palace to pay my respects to the duke, whom I found to be at Castello, beyond Ponte Arifredi. In the palace, I met Messer Pier Francesco Ricci, the majordomo, and when I drew nigh to pay him the usual compliments, he exclaimed with measureless astonishment, Oh, are you come back? And with the same air of surprise, clapping his hands together, he cried, The duke is at Castello, then turned his back and left me. I could not form the least idea why the beast behaved in such an extraordinary manner to me. Proceeding at once to Castello, and entering the garden where the duke was, I caught sight of him at a distance. But no sooner had he seen me than he showed signs of surprise, and intimated that I might go about my business. I had been reckoning that his excellency would treat me with the same kindness, or even greater, as before I left for Rome. So now, when he received me with such rudeness, I went back, much hurt, to Florence. While resuming my work and pushing my statue forward, I racked my brains to think what could have brought about this sudden change in the Duke's manner. The curious way in which Messer Sforza and some other gentlemen close to His Excellency's person eyed me, prompted me to ask the former what the matter was. He only replied with a sort of smile, Benvenuto, do your best to be an honest man, and have no concern for anything else. A few days afterwards, I obtained an audience of the Duke, who received me with a kind of grudging grace, and asked me what I had been doing at Rome. To the best of my ability, I maintained the conversation, and told him the whole story about Bindo Altoviti's bust. It was evident that he listened with attention. So I went on talking about Michele Agnolo Buonarroti. At this he showed displeasure, but Urbino's stupid speech about the flaying made him laugh aloud. Then he said, Well, it is he who suffers, and I took my leave. There can be no doubt that Sir Pier Francesco, the majordomo, must have served me some ill turn with the Duke, which did not, however, succeed. For God, who loves the truth, protected me, as he hath ever saved me, from a sea of dreadful dangers, and I hope will save me till the end of this my life, however full of trials it may be. I march forward, therefore, with a good heart, sustained alone by his divine power, nor let myself be terrified by any furious assault of fortune or my adverse stars. May only God maintain me in his grace." Chapter 83 I must beg your attention now, most gracious reader, for a very terrible event which happened. I used the utmost diligence and industry to complete my statue, and went to spend my evenings in the Duke's wardrobe, assisting there the goldsmiths who were working for His Excellency. Indeed, they labored mainly on designs which I had given them, Noticing that the Duke took pleasure in seeing me at work and talking with me, I took it into my head to go there sometimes, also by day. It happened upon one of those days that His Excellency came as usual to the room where I was occupied, and more particularly because he heard of my arrival. His Excellency entered at once into conversation, raising several interesting topics, upon which I gave my views so much to his entertainment that he showed more cheerfulness than I had ever seen in him before. All of a sudden, one of his secretaries appeared and whispered something of importance into his ear, whereupon the Duke rose and retired with the official into another chamber. Now the Duchess had sent to see what His Excellency was doing, and her page brought back this answer. 
the duke is talking and laughing with benvenuto and is in excellent good humour when the duchess heard this she came immediately to the wardrobe and not finding the duke there took a seat beside us after watching us at work a while she turned to me with the utmost graciousness and showed me a necklace of large and really very fine pearls on being asked by her what i thought of them i said it was in truth a very handsome ornament then she spoke as follows i should like the duke to buy them for me so i beg you my dear benvenuto to praise them to him as highly as you can at these words i disclosed my mind to the duchess with all the respect i could and answered my lady i thought this necklace of pearls belonged already to your most illustrious excellency now that i am aware that you have not yet acquired them it is right uh, nay more it is my duty to utter what i might otherwise have refrained from saying namely that my mature professional experience enables me to detect very grave faults in the pearls and for this reason i could never advise your excellency to purchase them she replied the merchant offers them for six thousand crowns and were it not for some of those trifling defects you speak of the rope would be worth over twelve thousand to this i replied that even were the necklace of quite flawless quality i could not advise any one to bid up to five thousand crowns for it for pearls are not gems pearls are but fishes bones which in the course of time must lose their freshness diamonds rubies emeralds and sapphires on the contrary never grow old these four are precious stones and these it is quite right to purchase when i had thus spoken the duchess showed some signs of irritation and exclaimed i have a mind to possess these pearls so prithee take them to the duke and praise them up to the skies even if you have to use some words beyond the bounds of truth speak them to do me service it will be well for you i have always been the greatest friend of truth and foe of lies yet compelled by necessity unwilling to lose the favour of so great a princess i took those confounded pearls sorely against my inclination and went with them over to the next room whither the duke had withdrawn no sooner did he set eyes upon me than he cried o oh, benvenuto what are you about here i uncovered the pearls and said my lord i am come to show you a most splendid necklace of pearls of the rarest quality and truly worthy of your excellency i do not believe it would be possible to put together eighty pearls which could show better than these do in a necklace my counsel therefore is that you should buy them for they are in good sooth miraculous he responded on the instant i do not choose to buy them they are not pearls of the quality and goodness you affirm i have seen the necklace and they do not please me then i added pardon me prince these pearls exceed in rarity and beauty any which were ever brought together for a necklace the duchess had risen and was standing behind a door listening to all i said well when i had praised the pearls a thousandfold more warmly than i have described above the duke turned towards me with a kindly look and said oh my dear benvenuto i know that you have an excellent judgment in these matters if the pearls are as rare as you certify i should not hesitate about their purchase partly to gratify the duchess and partly to possess them seeing i have always need of such things not so much for her grace as for the various uses of my sons and daughters when i heard him speak thus having once begun to tell fibs i stuck to them with even greater boldness i gave all the colour of truth i could to my lies confiding in the promise of the duchess to help me at the time of need more than two hundred crowns were to be my commission on the bargain and the duchess had intimated that i should receive so much but i was firmly resolved not to touch a farthing in order to secure my credit and convince the duke i was not prompted by avarice once more his excellency began to address me with the greatest courtesy i know that you are consummate judge of these things therefore if you are the honest man i always thought you tell me now the truth thereat i flushed up to my eyes which at the same time filled with tears and said to him my lord 
if i tell your most illustrious excellency the truth i shall make a mortal foe of the duchess this will oblige me to depart from florence and my enemies will begin at once to pour contempt upon my perseus which i have announced as a masterpiece to the most noble school of your illustrious excellency such being the case i recommend myself to your most illustrious excellency End of section 16